real life stories ranging from children with black eyes to finding a terrifying diary entry. Here are five real life creepy encounters episode three. Number five. I grew up on a farm in Ohio during the 80s where we raised dairy cows and grew corn. Since we had a lot of land, it was hard for someone to approach the house and not to be noticed. We could see cars approaching on the road from almost a mile away and our driveway was gravel so we could hear a car pull up from inside the house. The farmhouse was over 100 years old and every one of my family members has experienced things they can't explain in words. Before and after when this event happened. My bedroom was at the top of the stairs and I remember many nights hiding under my bed cover after hearing footsteps coming up the stairs. One summer afternoon when I was very young, my brother and I were playing with toys on the living room floor. My mother was out tending to the garden and my father was working in the barn. As we were playing, I saw something move in the corner of my eye. I looked up at the doorway that led into the living room and standing there was a man that I didn't know. He wore black pants and a tan t-shirt with a dark gray jacket over it. He had brown hair that was combed to the side and large wire frame glasses. My brother and I just stared at the man, completely horrified that a stranger had broken into our home. The man looks at us, then pulls up a camera to his face and took our photo. Without pulling the camera away, he stepped sideways out of the doorway and out of view. We went running out the back door and to the garden where our mother was working. We told her that there was a strange man in our house, but she didn't believe us. She told us that if anyone was at the house, we would have seen them coming since we can see them so far down the road. My father didn't believe us either. No one believed us until a few months later. My mom had finally used up the roll of film in her camera and had the photos developed. Among photos of birthday parties and summer fun was one photo of my brother and I sitting on the living room floor looking up in horror. Number four. My husband surprised me with a Dakota sport retriever this year. Bart, he is my constant companion and I love him just the way he is. When he came home, I never would have thought that he'd do what he has done. When we picked him up, the woman asked if we were getting him as a guard dog. We weren't. Several more times she asked to make sure we weren't getting him to be a guard dog, because while both breeds bark, they will rarely attack an intruder. We insisted that we weren't. He was to be our pet and companion. The first two weeks with Bart were great. He was a quick learner and never had an accident in the house, and would shadow someone in the family at all times. He seemingly had endless energy to play with our two-year-old son and never bark, even if someone knocked on the door. Even when my husband worked late and came home at 3 a.m., he wouldn't so much as open his eyes. We always joked that the woman we got him from was right. He was no guard dog. Then, we began to notice things. At first, they were small and even sort of funny. He would look out the windows and just stare, or he would cock his head and seem to be listening. We always laughed and said that he was seeing or hearing a ghost. Then he began to get up at night and do this. We repeatedly caught him staring out the windows in the middle of the night. And once, I could have sworn I heard him growl at the back door when I went downstairs for water. Last night, our opinion on Bart changed forever. All night, Bart had been acting odd. He was tense and wouldn't lay down, despite him normally always laying at my feet. My husband was working overnight, and so I stayed up late as usual, because it's hard to sleep without him. Finally, at about 11 p.m., I shut off the bedroom light to sleep and called Bart to me. He sat on the end of the bed, but still would not lay down and continued to seemingly stare off into space. Eventually, I passed out, still confused, but unconcerned. Not long after, I was awoken by a strange noise. It took me several moments to realize that it was Bart. He was growling. Now I was concerned. Stories of dogs turning on their owners ran through my head before I realized that he was looking outside the bedroom door. I tried to see through the darkness, but I could see nothing through the pitch black beyond the door. Then a glimpse of movement, and Bart let out the most ferocious bark I've ever heard, and leaped from the bed and through the door, and suddenly a scream pierced the air, and at first I was afraid Bart had attacked my husband or cousin. Then there was a struggling type noise, and more barking and heavy footsteps, running out of the hallway and down the stairs followed by the sound of Bart running after them. I heard the back door open and another scream, followed by a heavy thump and a grunt, then silence, except for Bart's growling. I rushed downstairs and flipped the lights 
to find the stranger knocked out, halfway out the door to our back patio, with Bart standing on his back. After calling the police and dragging Bart away, I called my husband. When the police arrived, they arrested the man and brought him around. After searching his backpack, they found a bundle of rope, handcuffs, a knife, and a rag soaked in paint thinner. As he started to come to while the police were taking my statement, another officer questioned him and he confessed to casing our house with the intent to rape me and burglarize our house. He even admitted to not being concerned about Bart because he never barked even when my cousin and husband came home late. It sent chills down my spine to know that he had not only been watching, but watching that long and enough to know that Bart didn't find that situation threatening. Number three, last night or this morning rather, at about 3.30, something woke me up from a deep sleep. It was a noise, though I can't remember the source. Maybe the air conditioner kicking on. I thought nothing of it, changed to a comfortable position and lay my head on the pillow. That's when I saw it staring at me from the other side of my bedroom window, a peeping Tom. I say it because I don't know if it was male or female. All I could see of it from my bed was its head concealed by a mask. It was one of those awful clown masks you usually see in drugstores around Halloween. I was unnerved to say the least. My immediate reaction was fear-induced paralysis. As reason began to set in, I decided to stay still. I didn't know how long it had been watching me, but I did know that a reaction from me could trigger a reaction from it, and I didn't want to take the chance that its reaction would be anything other than running away. If you're thinking at this point that maybe it wasn't a human at all, but just a lone mask someone had placed against my window as a cool prank, I wish I could say that you're right. I began to think the same thing to myself, but then it started to move. It stayed in the same spot, but its head slowly tilted from side to side. It was examining me. I wondered if it could see that my eyes were open and fixated on it in the dark. As afraid as I was to move, I was equally terrified to close my eyes. If my eyes were open, I had a measure of control, or so I repeated to myself over and over, probably in an attempt to calm my heart, which was beating faster and faster as the encounter lingered on. This is how it continued for what felt like hours, but really we're talking minutes, five, maybe ten. It tilted its head one last time, raised a black gloved hand into view, and gave a slow wave before it ducked down and out of view. I remained still for a little while, dreading its return. Then I summoned the strength to walk over to my window and take a peek. Nobody. Nothing. It was over. I called the police shortly after. There's little to nothing they could do, and I understand that. I hear of peeping Tom reports all the time, but I never thought I would be the victim of one. I guess victim is a strong word. I wasn't attacked, but my privacy was invaded, and that haunts me. I suppose it would have helped if I had its curtains to shut. Lesson learned. But what I still can't wrap my head around is what gives me chills just thinking about it, is how on earth a person can so easily watch me from the outside and then just disappear when my apartment has no balcony and is on the sixth floor. Number two, usually when you hear of black eyed children knocking on people's door, it's some schmo living on a farm in the middle of nowhere. But this was not the case. I live in the suburbs with neighbors all around and cars driving by at all hours of the night. And though I believe in the paranormal, I never thought I would have the encounter that I had. It happened earlier this year, around Thanksgiving 2016. Like any holiday, there were lots of neighbors hosting parties with their families and random kids, running during the day and playing outside. Which I guess is one of the reasons I was as foolish as I was that day. The sun was just going down and I was home alone watching TV and eating some turkey. That's when I heard a knock. I looked at the clock and it was almost 7.30. Thinking it was one of the neighbors, I swung the door open without even looking, and there stood two kids. One of them was a little boy with a baseball cap on, blue jeans, and a jersey. The other one was younger and shorter, but with no cap, and looking towards the floor. I looked to them and asked if they needed anything, and the older boy chirped, Yes, we just need to come in to get our baseball from your yard. As soon as he said that, a chill went down my spine and I had a horrible feeling that I should not let these boys in. I looked at him, studying his face, and in the back of my head, I knew something was wrong with him, but I just couldn't place it. He must have noticed my hesitation, because he exclaimed, Come on, man, we just want our ball back. 
And that's when I realized this child had no whites in his eye. I was kind of shocked and flabbergasted. At first, I thought they were black contact lenses. I looked over at his brother, and I noticed he had the same eyes. My face must have given it away, because as soon as I looked back to the leader, his eyes filled with hatred, and his cool smile turned into an evil smirk. And I swear, he stood taller and more confident, staring into my eyes and that smile that hinted he knew what I was thinking. At that moment, the atmosphere changed from what I perceived at the beginning of the encounter as two normal and innocent boys standing in front of me, wanting their ball back, to two inhumane beings, wanting to invade my home and create havoc onto my life. I just stared at him as he smirked. The smaller boy stood firmly and confidently on two feet, and he got taller, and he also stared. After about 30 seconds of staring, the smaller boy broke the silence. Come on, man, just let us in. And the way he said it, I could tell something changed in him, because he spoke with such conviction in his voice. I stared at him, and he smirked, all knowingly, and I didn't know what to say. In my head, I wanted to scream and call them out, to tell them they were demons from another world, and to get off my porch. But at the same time, I began to wonder about my safety. If I did that, it could only be worse for me. I mean, what if instead of just asking to come in, they force their way into my home and my life? What if they get violent? I thought to myself, this charade we're playing by pretending this isn't what this is, if I don't play this game anymore, it could only be detrimental to my own health and well-being. I made the decision to keep playing, and I looked at the smaller of the two boys, and I said, yeah, I'll get it for you, and grabbed the door and slammed it right in their face, and began walking. I turned on all the lights and sat on my couch, with my feet pulled up to my chin, and I began to shake and rock back and forth, and listen, but I heard nothing. No laughter outside, no children playing, no shuffling at my door. The world fell at a standstill as I sat there silently in fetal position, and then I heard a slow knock at my door. I immediately stopped rocking and stood still listening intently as another knock fell upon the door. I didn't know what to do. I stared at the door and listened as another knock came through the door. I refused to get up, my body so stiff and my arms so tightly wrapped around my legs. I could feel the veins in my arms pumping in blood. And the slow knock continued for at least two minutes, followed by silence. So piercing, I wondered if I lost my hearing. The entire night went by and I sat in my living room, not knowing what to do. I don't know when I dozed off, but I woke up at around 2 a.m. and the lights were off in my house. The TV screen that was once on Comedy Central, now filled with black and white static. I don't know how, but something was inside my home. Number one, I work for a company that does renovations for building materials, and my buddy found this diary entry it was folded under some moldy, water-damaged carpeting that we were replacing. It looks to be written on a piece of hotel stationery, but it doesn't match up with the type of paper found at this day on Main. It's been three days since they moved me to my own room. Pete and Julie seemed like such nice people on the surface. I paid for a week in one of the shared rooms, but they must have complained to the hotel staff, told them some lie. If it wasn't for Gus, I wouldn't have been able to stay in that room with those people. I found that Gus and I were a lot alike. We both held on to that playful part of being a child that most people let die away. When it was just us in the room, we would talk, but when the others came in late at night, we just got in our beds and hid under the covers. Our beds were both against the wall, his next to mine, and we had moved them together so that the metal bars of the headboards were touching. We'd lay our blankets over so that we had our own space. It was fun pretending to be locked up in a tiny jail cell together, talking all throughout the night, laughing every once in a while at the sounds the others made in their beds. There was a junkie that slept there, and he would moan all night. He either couldn't sweep together enough cash, or he must have come here to try and let the chemicals balance themselves out. We're all at the mercy of chemicals. One morning, I came up from breakfast, and a hotel employee was standing outside our room. He just smiled and said, So sorry for the trouble but some of our guests haven't been sleeping well, so we moved you to your own room upstairs for the same rate. I told him how ridiculous it was that I couldn't have been disturbing anyone, 
but in the end I just took the room. I got in the elevator and went up to one of the top floors. When the elevator opened, I saw my reflection in the mirror, hanging on the wall, and I was smiling with all my teeth showing. They're so straight and white. I thought about that junkie that slept downstairs. The veins on his arm had been blackened from constant abuse, and the skin looked to be just barely hanging on. I imagined biting into the crook of his arm and sucking out all of that poison and letting it filter through my body. It's what I had been doing anyway, only it was my family's bad chemicals. They were no match. I was still pure and innocent, and so anything given to me would be made good again. I started to get bored being in that room by myself, though it was the worst time of the month for me, though it was good that I didn't have Pete and Julie with me. I knew it was just my childhood trying to leave me. I hadn't brought anything to prepare for it, so I considered making a visit to the visiting room across the street. It was coming on fast, and I tried my best to keep it all in. I was considering my options when I heard a knock at the door. I changed into a pair of loose gym shorts and a red hoodie. I looked through the peephole, but I couldn't see anyone. After a minute or so, I opened the door and stepped out into the hallway. I looked over and saw a face shift behind the wall. The face reappeared as I took a step back towards my room. It was just Gus trying to play a game with me. I walked out into the hall and called the elevator up. Every time I saw his face in the corner of my eye, I would point to him, and he'd hide again. When the elevator opened, I stepped inside and pushed several buttons to different floors, like I did when I was a kid. He kept pushing the buttons on the outside of the elevator, so it wouldn't close. I caught him almost every time. Eventually, the game turned to hide and seek. We explored every inch of the hotel, finding each other every time. We played for hours until I finally had to sleep. We're going to play again tonight, and I have the best hiding spot yet. There's the water tank on the roof, and I'm going to climb inside of it. I need a bath anyway. I'll just let my childhood seep into that warm water so it can wash over Pete and Julie. Maybe they'll even drink it in. The tank is pretty tall, so I'll need Gus to help me out. I may be in there for hours, but Gus always finds me eventually.